Hello everyone, I will be presenting one of the late Iraqi architect uh, Rifat Shadirji's works uh, titled Architectural Education in Iraq, a case study by Rifat Shadirji. Um, the reason I'm presenting this is I think it's a great gateway into Chatterjee's philosophy and works for anyone who had not yet explored them. Uh, I'd like to begin with a very brief introduction on Rifat Chatterjee. Uh, in the interest of time, it will be super brief because I'm going to allocate majority of the time of the presentation to the, discussing the actual work. Uh, so Rifat Chatterjee, who, so who is Rifat Shadirji? Uh, an Iraqi ar architect and artist born in 1926 in Baghdad and obtained a diploma in architecture from British Hammersmith uh, School uh, of Crafts and Arts in 1950. Uh, he, he was a contemporary who looked at the past in order to work towards the future. He was a connoisseur of music and theater and a creative photographer. Engaged in philosophical and existential introspections, he studied these existential philosophical elements in his books to document the effect of architecture and the built environment and its repercussions. So going back to the work, which I will be discussing today, uh, it's actually uh, a presentation which Shrifat Shadirji gave in 1986. In it, Shadirji opens by stating that uh, at, at, the point, um, at the point this presentation was given, Iraqi architecture has been in a state of rapid decline and to quote, in a state of total aesthetic collapse. Every professional activity related to the built environment was affected. This situation uh, curiously also prevailed in spite of the fact that by the beginning of the 80s, Iraq had five institutes of higher education offering degrees in architecture and more than 700 practicing architects as opposed to in the past when we did not have um, uh, professional uh, practicing architects. Um, Chaderji sought to answer questions like, how could such a situation have developed? Is it a situation unique to Iraq? Can there be an effective remedy for the situation based on a theoretical approach to the issues involved? He goes on to answer these questions by identifying the composition of the building industry in Iraq and also uh, by presenting uh, this within, a brief, uh, within the context of a brief history uh, of that industry. Uh, starting off, uh, Iraq at the end of the 19th century was a country which was still re uh, recovering from a devastating su succession of wars and invasions that had spanned some 600 years. Uh, although it should be mentioned that no large uh, scale projects had been undertaken during that time, the country's architectural traditions until the late 19th century remained alive and effective nonetheless. Uh, generally speaking, the situation prevailed in Iraq until uh, the First World War, at which point there was still no proper professional uh, or academic uh, architects in the country. And it's important to mention here that uh, Shadirji makes a distinction between the term architect, which uh, he believes should be identified with the totality of building, uh, totality of building operations carried out by all the performers uh, involved, uh, and academic architects. So architectural education as an academic activity began in Iraq in the early 1960s, roughly. Prior to this, students of architecture studied outside the country. Iraq's very first architect actually had therefore obtained their degrees abroad and returned to the country to practice in 1935. By 1955, there were some 15 Iraqi architects in the country. And in the late 80s, 30 years later, Iraq could boast more than 1,000 architects. The majority of these professionals have been educated in Iraqi universities, but approximately one third live and practice, uh, lived and practiced abroad. So back to the timeline. So we're still at pre-First World War. Nearly all building activities were carried out under the control and direction of local craftsmen, stonemasons, uh, carpenters, or bricklayers, um, for example, who perpetuated the traditions and aesthetic values, uh, uh, aesthetic values of their individual craft within this broader role uh, as master builders. 
So building activities uh, included the manufacture of materials, the design and selection of building elements, site management and coordination, and finally the manu manufacture of the equipment itself. In this process, the master builders also created new aesthetic values of their own satisfaction, and the quality of their work was, to quote Chaderji, consistently good. However, another situation was also developing during that same part, uh, time period. Iraqi engineers and foreign engineers within Iraq began to prepare designs and foreign architects would sometimes, if only rarely, design major public buildings for Iraq. The works of uh, these academically trained professionals was also almost always good. During the First World War, architecture in Iraq entered a new phase. The British had arrived. Um, and among them were some capable academic architects who resolved uh, to couple their own talents with those of Iraqi master builders. So from 1920 to 1924, those projects that combined effort uh, produced in most cases an architecture of admirable quality, as opposed to during the same time, uh, efforts that were not undertaken jointly, uh, those usually did not succeed in the 20s. Um, uh, so in, in the 20s, we also have modern technology, uh, which introduced major innovations, which would soon affect not only the use of materials and their manufacture, but also basic work methods. Gradually, the role of the local master bu builders in the production process became subordinate subordinate to the role of the academically trained newcomers and those newcomers being the British architects and both the Iraqi and British civil engineers who were uh, versed in the new technology. Uh, by the end of the 1930s, British architects were uh, no longer foreign expatriates residing in the country, but rather visiting consultants. All these factors contributed to the development of a rupture in Iraqi building industry in general, which consequently polarized production. Uh, it polarized production as a process into two different camps, with the traditional master builders in one camp and the new this new uh, academic professional in the other. Iraqi master builders were losing ground technically to the spreading influence of three developments. One, the introduction of new materials such as concrete and steel framing. Two, the, int the introduction of new methods of design and calculation. Three, the importation of new design aesthetics. The second camp, which is that of academic professionals, were in fact isolated from the building industry at large by their academic training. Uh, however, the overall situation was such that both camps managed to produce, uh, up until this period, were still producing fairly good work uh, during the years immediately preceding the Second World War. From the outbreak, outbreak of World War II until the revolution of 1958, architecture of, uh, and the building industry in Iraq deteriorated further uh, due to several factors, such as one, a steady increase in the importation of materials. This increase aggravated a situation which, or, which was already existing wherein new materials were routinely incorporated into production without ever have been, uh, uh, having been uh, tried locally. Two, the introduction of modern methods of site management and implementation. Again, this factor implies the introduction of new technology without Iraqi participation in the establishment of it. So in other words, the rationale of this new technology was not locally oriented. Uh, the increased isolation, as mentioned earlier, of academic architects from the bulk of building production by their formal education, by the social status associated with this education, by their proven uh, professional capabilities, and by the steady increase in their number, uh, academic architects in Iraq had become the country's design elite. But their privileged status removed them even further from production realities overall as they grew more and more isolated from the industry. Production in general, which, which was now managed entirely by civil engineers or traditional master builders, itself also became increasingly isolated from the professional influence of architects. And then after World War II, the following sociopolitical trends that were present uh, in Iraq uh, during the 60s and 70s include one inappropriate distribution of the national capital investment, and this pushed uh, rural migrations to the country's urban centers, and then 
these rural migrations into urban centers eventually required some kind of urbanized built environment to accommodate them. So, of course, uh, uh, neither the planning authorities nor the academic professionals were capable of dealing with this rapidly increasing demand. Two, the inappropriate planning for industrialization made the country increasingly dependent on imported technology. Uh, three, a commitment to prestige projects required, of course, the importation of unnecessary technology. And four, politicization of the academic educational systems caused the quality of education in general to deteriorate. The cumulative result of all these aspects, various trends and developments was that by 1980, Iraq was in a state of, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a total aesthetic collapse. And now uh, to conclude uh, this presentation, after identifying all the uh, causes, Chaderji concludes by arguing that for any architecture of excellence to be produced at any time, the culture which is to generate it uh, uh, must have an articulated social need. Secondly, this culture must have its own social technology, that is its own scientific knowledge and production methodologies and know-hows. Uh, lastly, it must have its own values. Chaderji believed in the power of education to remedy the situation. However, in formulating an educational philosophy for architecture, we must keep in mind exactly what we mean by architecture. Uh, going back to uh, the start of the presentation, um, in his opinion, architecture must include the totality of, uh, must encompass the totality of building. Um, not, uh, it must be understood that by education, we mean a process in which both the performance of this practice and the recipients of it participate, and whose objective is not to produce an isolated body of professionals of a partic particular status, uh, implementing designs which are ultimately inappropriate, but to achieve a general architecture worthy of the society in which that architecture is produced. And uh, this is where my um, presentation ends. Uh, I added some, a couple other further readings if you'd like to explore the work of Chaderji further. And this is my Instagram handle. Thank you.